Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. Today's video is gonna be absolutely bonkers and the data is in and obviously today we have Jack back on our program to give us an economic update on what's going on with the job market. So Jack today is actually gonna go into the job numbers. He's gonna really let us know why the job numbers really aren't as strong as they appear to be. And one thing that we want to pay attention to you guys right now is specifically in the housing market is the demand. There is so much toxic demand right now. It's super important as far as many things, but one really important thing is to watch unemployment. So Jack, I appreciate you being here, sir. How are you today? I'm doing great, Travis. Thank you for having me back on. It's a pleasure to be here. I had a great time talking with you last week about GDP. And now we're back to talk about jobs because I think the job market is the key to the housing market, all right? And everybody wants to know what's going on with housing. The housing market's frozen right now. There's very little supply, but there's also very little demand. And the key to both sides of that equation is employment. You've got the key to the demand for houses is do people get big enough raises to be able to afford these record unaffordable homes right now? And the key to the supply is what happens if people lose their jobs? Well, then they become home sellers, whether they like their current two and a half percent mortgage or not, because they're forced to sell their home because they lost their job. So the key to the housing market is the job market right now. And we're going to yeah. see here from some of this data that the job market is not anywhere near as strong as they've been advertising to us for the last year or so. So with that, yeah. uh, I got a whole bunch of charts, a whole bunch of stuff ready. You want to share my screen? Yeah, man. But, you know, just like last time, I know how excited you get. But first, let me plug you, yeah. man. You keep chopping at the bit. Yeah. <laughs> this is an important thing. So you guys, this is his channel. This is no, but this is Jack's channel. Nobody's special finance. The reason personally, Jack, and I'm not, you know, the reason I listen to you is you're no nonsense and you get straight to the point. You talk about some really important stuff and I love the flow. Uh, so again, man, I really appreciate you being here, Jack. I'm going to go ahead and just give you the mic. Let me throw up your screen right here and take it away, sir. All right. Thank you, Travis. And uh, first thing we're looking at here, this, this chart speaks volumes about more so than anything, while we've been told for the last two years that there's been a labor shortage and that there's been so much tightness in the labor market and, oh, there were so many job openings. Well, then why was labor getting cheaper the whole time? This is U.S. real average hourly earnings, and this is measuring the year over year change in them. So this is how much money we make adjusted for inflation. All right. Above zero means we're getting wealthier relative to the cost of living. Below zero means we're getting poorer relative to the cost of living. And you can see for two consecutive years, right up until this most recent jobs print, for two years straight, cost of living has been rising faster than our wages. So if we have really had a labor shortage, then why has, been labor, has labor been getting cheaper compared to everything else? That violates the law of supply and demand. If labor was indeed in short supply and the demand for it was so high, then the price of labor would have been rising this whole time relative to the price of everything else, but that hasn't happened. And another thing I would say is throughout this entire exercise and terrible monetary policy from our leadership, they've been understating the rate of inflation. If you actually look at what the price of gasoline did in 21 and 22, what the price of a house did, what the price of rent did, what cars did, virtually everything, the price rose much faster than the advertised rate of inflation that they told us. The highest inflation we saw supposedly was in June of last year at 9.1%. Anybody who's been living on planet Earth knows life got more than 9% more expensive in 2022. So really, this number should be even further into negative territory if you factor in what the real rate of inflation was. But it does paint the picture that it's, we've been below zero for two years. We have been getting poorer relative to the cost of living. And that flies in the face of the very concept of a labor shortage. And we're going to look behind all these other data points and we can see it elsewhere in the numbers. And, and Jack, just so I'm on the same page, basically what you're pointing out is, you know, for the sake of argument, the three possibilities, specifically two possibilities I want to hone in, either we are income and the money we're bringing up adjusts with these prices or we have a recession. So when I'm first looking at this chart, Jack, and I see that actually wage growth was actually down from it looks like mid 2021 to kind of recently here, 
that tells me again that that that's not built on on sustainability, that not fundamentals, and more than likely there's a higher probability of recession versus we're all going to magically make more money. Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, you know, they're they're doing a thing and telling us it's raining. I don't want to get you in trouble, but you know, everybody and anybody at home watching right now can probably think of some sacrifice they've had to make over the last two years, something they've had to do without, some service they've had to cancel or maybe they're buying more hamburgers and ground beef instead of more T-bones and prime rib because they've had to trade down because the price of inflation has exceeded the raises they got at work. And even if you got a nice raise in the last few years, congratulations if you did, chances are that raise was smaller than the increase in your cost of living. So that is this chart visualized. This is life getting more expensive for us relative to our incomes. And again, this chart understates that effect because the rate of inflation has actually been much higher than they've been telling us. Here's the actual job numbers. This just came in on Friday. We had 187,000 jobs created in the economy. Oh, great. My economic plan is working, says all the politicians. You know, oh, strong and resilient, all that fun stuff that they love to tell us. Well, first and foremost, the population grew more than 187,000 during that time. So fewer jobs were created than people came here or people entering the workforce. So that's one thing. Uh, but 187,000 jobs, you'll notice this has been trending down. Forget this big jump in January. That's a, kind of an outlier. But you can see that the number of jobs added every month has been trending down. And that's because the Federal Reserve has been waging war on your job. The Federal Reserve created inflation that caused those negative real wages for you, that made you poorer. And now before you get a raise, they're trying to put companies out of business to put people out of work to make sure those raises never come because according to the central bankers, if you get a raise, you're gonna go out and spend that extra money and cause more inflation. So what they're saying without saying it is the key to fighting inflation is to make you poorer and that's what they're doing. Now, a couple other points I'll make, the unemployment rate bouncing around between 3.7 and 3.4%. Now this is historically incredibly low unemployment, but this doesn't tell the whole picture because the unemployment rate only counts the number of people 16 years and older who are out of work but are trying to work, right? So they take the entirety of the workforce, all the people who are working and all the people who wanna be working, and they're saying within that subset, how many of them are out of work? And that's only 3.5% right now. But that doesn't count all the people who have given up. That doesn't mm -hmm. count all the people who have left the workforce who aren't even trying anymore. And for that, you get a better picture if you look at labor force participation rate. Now this is counting the entire population 16 and over, and out of them, how many people are either working or trying to work? In, in other words, how big is the workforce relative to everybody? And you can see 62.6% of capable people are actually working. That leaves a lot of people who dropped out of the workforce. And if we zoom out on this chart about five years, now you can see when the pandemic hit in 2020, a lot of people left the workforce and still, even though it's been rising steadily and it's flatlined these last few months, we're still settling much lower than we were pre-pandemic. So a yeah. lot of people stopped working and gave up. They didn't come back in. At that time, you've had a lot of retirements too. We have an aging population, so that could partially explain this. But a lot, a lot of people just gave up. And that's interesting, Jack, because you know the whole everything we're hearing in the headlines is, is how tight the labor market is. And I understand the headlines. We started quantitative tightening at 3.6 percent unemployment. What 16 months later, the unemployment is lower. There's a lot does, that doesn't make sense. But when we look at that participation rate, we can see that. There's actually a, you know, there's a lot more people that are not working than pre COVID. Very interesting yeah. to see that. Now, now, why aren't they working, Jack? Well, I suspect retirement has played a role here, right? We, the baby boomers are aging out of the workforce and we don't have as many people aging in. Uh, but you also have a lot of people who are just dejected people who just gave up, you know, they, they said, no matter what I do, I'm just going to make somebody else rich. So I'm not even going to try anymore. Now I don't subscribe to that mentality personally, but I can understand what's driving that. And we're gonna see in some of the charts that there's actually a legitimate reason for that. You know, I don't want people to give up, but when you get into what's been done and the, the frog in the pot of boiling water, you understand why some people are just opting out. Now, another thing I would point out, you know, we started this hiking cycle in about 2022, the very beginning of, the, of last year, 
That's economic hardship is pushing some people back into the workforce. That's people being unretired for economic reasons. You know, grandma turns out the cost of living went up so much, but her pension didn't go up. Her social security didn't go up that much. So she needs to go get a part-time job to make ends meet. So the workforce grew, somebody came back into it. And you also have people who had given up and well, now the stimmies have finally run out and they finally spent all that money. Now begrudgingly, they're going back into the workforce. But still, you've got a couple of percent that just left and didn't come back yet. Now, another thing I want to point out, we talked about that 187,000 jobs added in this latest jobs report. I also want to talk about jobs revisions. And, and this is one of the things I always tell people on my channel, beware this, the infectious stink of politics, because when data gets corrupted by politics, that data no longer becomes useful. And, you know, certain things need to rise above politics, like science and like economic data. It's just too important. You can't let that stink in. And what we're looking mm. at here is revisions to the monthly jobs numbers. Interesting. And six, six months in a row now, every month this year, when the jobs report comes out, they quietly revise the previous month's job numbers down. It's happened mm. every single month this year. You can see the green number is yep. the initially reported jobs gained and the politicians go make their speeches and congratulations. <laughs> they pat themselves on the back. They say, you're welcome. Right. And then a month later, they revise it down to no fanfare. All right. There's no headlines when they revise it down. Nobody goes back and says, oh, my bad. No, whoops. Sorry. That didn't actually happen. And so far this year, there have been more than a quarter of a million jobs revised down. If you add up all of these arrows here, all of these declines, a quarter of a million jobs that they claim they created and then they went back and said sorry we didn't now if this was just the normal standard deviation error distribution of data collection which is you know anybody who studies statistics knows you're going to have that but the errors work in both directions when the error is in the same direction every time mm. to the benefit of the people reporting the data that means that that science that that data is corrupted and you can see that here in this chart Clearly, there is something going on when the errors are in the same direction every single time you got to cry foul. All right. So that's another reason why these numbers are just not as the, the job market is not as strong as they're saying they're artificially inflating the jobs numbers to make themselves look better. Yeah, you know, I think I understand what you're saying, Jack. Basically, that maybe the job market is not as good as it appears to be. And maybe what it is is kind of a political show. I don't know if we have an election next year. Maybe we have an election next year. I'm not sure. But holy smokes, man. That, and that is one of the things that does drive me crazy because we as consumers, we lean on this data. So when we see, you know, these reflections, this downward trajectory on every single job number after they've done their celebratory speeches, it's pretty ugly, Jack. I understand why people have so much hate for the government. I mean, this is this is really yeah. this is really depressing. Keep going. So I'm sorry to interrupting. If you take that hundred and eighty seven thousand jobs that were just added, you also have to factor they revised last month's numbers down by twenty five thousand and the month before that down by twenty four thousand. So yeah, we had 187,000 jobs added, but there was 49,000 in downward revisions to prior months. So now we're down to 100, what, 138,000 jobs added net. And remember the population grew by 200,000. So actually the job market got weaker in the last month. It got a lot weaker. And again, I go back to this original chart. Now you understand why labor was getting cheaper all along because there really was no strong jobs market. It was fake. It was skewed data. Now we do finally, this most recent data point here, 1.19% positive real wage growth in the last number. So last month was the first time in two years that the raises were bigger than inflation. And you can see they're doing everything they can to snuff that out as soon as possible to prevent us from catching up. You can see more in of the weakness. This is the actual Bureau of Labor Statistics report, the actual jobs report. They call it the employment situation. All right. And, you know, we're going to go past all the headlines and everything. I want to draw your attention to page 21 of this report. And guys, these reports, they're so long and there's so much fluff and junk in here. It's really hard to sort through all of this data. The juice is in there, the, the real meat and potatoes of this article. Maybe there's some more food analogies I could throw in here, but the really good stuff, you gotta go to these charts all the way down at the bottom. And it's in table A9 of the household data that you actually find the real weakness in the job market. 
Now, right here, they're talking about full-time and part-time workers. All right, and I, let's see if I can mm -hmm. zoom in a little bit. You, mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. you can just make it out, right? Full-time workers, that's these two numbers. Right. right now, the first number here on the left, that is the number of full-time workers in June. Yes. And then here is the number of full-time workers in July. Okay. We went from 134,000,000.859 to 134,000.274. I'm sorry, 134,000,000.274. These numbers are in thousands. So when they show 134,000, that's actually 134 million. But if you subtract the July number from the June number, we lost 585,000 full-time workers in the last month. 585,000 fewer people are working full-time. But wait, they told us we added 187,000 jobs. What gives? Well, when you look at the number below it, the part-time labor, we went from 26.18 million working part-time in June to 27.15 working part-time in July. So while we lost over half a million full-time jobs, we gained almost 1 million part-time jobs. Now that's not prosperity. Mm. That's people losing white collar, well-paying jobs and getting a job as a barista at Starbucks. Jack it's not a strong jobs market, Travis. <laughs> no, and dude, I didn't know that. Dude, this is the first time I'm seeing this data. And if I'm, if I'm accurately looking at this, lost roughly a quarter million full-time jobs. All that's been happening here is that is essentially being replaced by part-time jobs. Is that correct, Jack? That's correct. And wow. not only is it being replaced by part-time jobs, and again, you're mm -hmm. talking a big trade down. When you go from full-time to part-time, you're talking working fewer hours, usually lower hourly yeah. rate, no, fewer benefits, right? No so medical, this, right. Yeah, right. this is real economic hardship, but it gets even better. Check out the chart below the full or part-time status. You've got multiple job holders, people who are getting second jobs, right? That went from 7.995 million to 8.113 million. So you had, what is that, about 120,000 yeah. people yeah. had to get second jobs in one month. I'm pretty sure they're starting to feel this unaffordability, brother. Do people get second jobs because times are good? <laughs> you know, I don't know about you. You get home from a full-time job, the last thing you want to do is change into your Starbucks uniform and go do your second part-time job that you have to do just to afford the higher rent because your cost of living outpaced your increase in wages. Astonishing. And you can see that, go back a few months, we were only, this is continuing, we are at 7.7 .7 million back in April, Jeez, and now we're dude. at 8.1 million wow. working multiple jobs in the economy. 400,000 more people since April have a second time job, probably we can logically say to afford to get by. Mm -hmm. Paycheck to paycheck, brother, paycheck to paycheck. And, and, you know, also all the cost that comes with that, right? That is, that's mom or dad not making Little League games. That's time away from the yeah. family. That's less recreation. That's lower quality of life for those people. All right, that's, that's the, the big takeaway from there. And again, if this was such a strong jobs market, yeah. people would not be forced to get a second job yeah. if they were prospering. Jack, right? can I ask you, and maybe it's in the presentation, how many of those jobs were government jobs? Uh, I don't have that number specifically. You, they do break out government versus versus non-government, and it's it's all over this. I mean, if I just search government, you get 15 hits. So according to this report, they're saying employment showed little change over the month in other major industries like mining, quarrying, oil, gas extraction, yada yada yada, and government jobs. So there there really weren't that many government jobs added in this in this latest month. But I would add that there was a lot of construction jobs added, 19,000. And the reason why we're getting a lot of construction jobs added in the economy right now is because there's a lot of government subsidies for the construction of factories for things like EVs and things like mm. chips. We talked about that in the GDP video last week. So you yeah. do see government driving some of this job growth, but it's not really, it's not a major okay. factor in this. Okay. Now, another thing I want to talk about is the number of people that are quitting their job and the number of job openings. Now, you may be familiar with the phrase, the great resignation. That's yes. something that, a phenomenon that popped up after the pandemic around 2021, people started leaving their jobs and getting other ones. Now, we actually did have a little bit of a tight job market for a little while there because people could quit their job and right away get hired somewhere else. 
But that has been going down in the last last month. This is from the JOLTS report that came out on Wednesday, Wednesday, the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. That measures how many job openings there are and how many people are quitting their job to chase them. There was 3.77 million people quit their jobs in June. Now, that's still a lot of people. That's historically pretty high. But you'll notice this is really trending down here as the great resignation comes to an end because the job market is not really as strong as they're advertising. You can see that in a five-year chart here of people quitting their job. We had a big drop after the pandemic, and then the stimmies came, and people started quitting their job in higher numbers. And then right around the beginning of 2022, all of a sudden it spiked, and you had almost four and a half people a month quitting their jobs. But that number has been trending down ever since the beginning of 2022 when Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. Hmm. That's when it became harder for people to just quit their jobs and get another one. And you can see the number of people quitting their jobs is coming down pretty rapidly, still just above where it was pre-pandemic. You can also see that in job openings. Now, this is one of the easiest categories to see how the change after the pandemic has made the job market look tighter or made the job market look stronger than it really <laughs> is. Now, you had 9.58 million job openings in the U.S. economy in the last month, and that's still historically incredibly high. But that is also down from the highs we saw in December of last year of 11.2 million job openings in the month. So the number of open jobs is in decline. But I want to zoom out on this chart a little bit. Again, this looks a lot like the chart of people quitting their jobs. The number of job openings, it fell off a cliff when the pandemic hit. And then it started to rise as the stimmy started flowing and interest rates were lowered. And then it just went vertical in 2021. All right, and it peaked at almost 12 million job openings in the United States at the beginning of 2022. Then comes Jerome Powell with his rate hikes, and now job openings start going away yeah. as the Federal Reserve inflicts financial hardship on the job market. But this chart ignores the new reality of work from home. And that's why we got this big spike in 2021, because there was a fundamental change in the labor market that we'd never, ever seen before in history. Mm -hmm. And that was the work from home phenomenon. And that makes the job market look stronger than it is. And I got to give a shout out to my buddy, the happy Hawaiian on Twitter, who turned me on to this chart for the first time a few months ago. Now, this is data put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And what you're looking at here in these dots, each dot represents the X axis is the unemployment rate. And then the Y axis is the number of job openings or the vacancy rate that corresponds to that unemployment rate. And the gray numbers here, these are before the pandemic. So you can see before the pandemic, if unemployment was about 8%, you'd usually have about a 3% vacancy rate. If unemployment dropped to 4%, you'd have about a 5% vacancy rate. And it makes sense as there's fewer candidates to fill open positions because the unemployment rate gets lower, you end up with more open positions, right? And you had a pretty even linear distribution here. But look what happened after the pandemic. The whole chart shifted up in a big way. Now, when you have 8% unemployment, now you have almost 5% yeah. vacancy rate. There's yeah. more job openings for the corresponding level of unemployment. And as you get down here, look at here, there's way yep. more job openings now where unemployment is about 4%. Now, the job openings rate, the vacancy rate is about 7% versus it was only four and a half yeah. before the pandemic. Yeah. Jack, do you think that a primary result of, of it being so elevated like that is the PPP EIDL loans through COVID through small to small businesses? I think PPP prevented the unemployment rate from going so low. Um, it, uh, I'm sorry, like from, from going, going much higher. Yeah. But honestly, PPP was just uh, was a cesspool of fraud. And, uh, you know, f fun fact, if you want to Google after the fact, Google Cross River Bank from Teaneck, New Jersey and payroll oh. protection plans. And you'll see yeah. just this, how much grotesque fraud there was in, in the PPP program. It was just it was it was a free for all for scam artists. Uh, but what, what this chart is really showing you is multiple postings for the same job mm. because of work from home. Say there's a job for a data analyst. I can post that job in New York City, but the guy doesn't have to live in New York. So I can also wow. post that job in Florida and LA and Chicago and Boise and all these other cities across the country. I'm only filling one position, but there's five or six job postings. So oh it my looks God. like there's more yeah. jobs available than there really are. I do, and why aren't they, why isn't there a better way to track? I mean, I mean, why are they double counting things? Like, I mean, even, even more than double counting, if there's a work from home job, they could technically 
solicit in 50 different states. And so they yep. count 50 job openings. That doesn't seem like an accurate way to monitor this, Jack. It's not. And, and what happened because of this, the unfortunate situation of 2020, there was this urgent need for this paradigm shift in the way we worked and the way we measure work did not adapt along with that. And so we're over counting open positions now. The, date, the, the way we collect the data has not evolved with the way we work. And so it's making this job, we're, we're viewing the strength of the job market through the lens of 2019 when we need to change out yeah. that lens for yeah. the new reality with the work from home trend. Well said. So now we got to come to this one, inflation, all right? And, and this is when you have to understand what's being done to you and, and how almost sinister it is. Inflation hits in a very predictable sequence of events throughout history. We've seen bouts of inflation and they've been studied ad nauseum. There's no shortage of books and texts on it. First, you get a big expansion of credit, a big expansion in the money supply. And that's what happened in 2022, right? Credit interest rates were lowered to zero and stimmies were put out and the payroll protection plans and everything, right? All this money just helicoptering from the sky, right? First, you get the money, the expansion in the money supply. The first thing that happens is asset prices start going up. We see it in stocks. We saw it in houses. We saw it in bonds. Everything, all the, all the assets, all the places rich people park their money, that goes up first. So when there's inflation, the first people to benefit are the ownership class, the wealthy. Now, the second thing that happens with inflation in the sequence of events is consumer prices start going up. And that was 2021 and 2022, and we're all familiar with how that went, right? We all got poorer in 2022 because our wages didn't rise, but our cost of living went up. And then the last thing that happens in the inflation cycle after the money supply expands, after the assets go up and after consumer prices go up, lastly, wages start to rise. And that's where we are now. Wages are finally starting to rise. We just got our first month of positive real wage growth. Now everybody is demanding that raise and they're getting it, okay? So we finally had our first month of life getting a little easier. Nobody noticed because we just spent two years getting poorer. So, you know, if you've already got a thousand pounds on your back, if somebody takes five pounds off, you're not gonna feel it, all right? But if that happens over and over and over again, eventually you start to feel some relief. That's just starting now. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because along comes this guy, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he cannot allow it. He can't let you have that relief. He's worried, he's these Keynesian economists that run the system, they're worried about wage spiral inflation, all right? You've already gotten poor from the increase in the standard of living, but they're worried that if you get a raise, if you get more money, that you're gonna go spend that money and it'll make inflation worse. And so their solution is to keep you poor, to not let you catch up. Isn't that nice of them? Because they, with a capital T, I always say, they already got wealthier because the assets that they own went up in value. Their businesses, their stocks are worth more, their houses are worth more, right? The yeah. assets went up in value, then the standard of living, the cost of living went up. Now the wages are starting to rise, and now Jerome Powell says, nope, time to put on the boxing glove, time to raise interest rates, time to put people out of work. Now they'll call it time to reduce demand. That's how he phrases it. He'll tell you he's acutely aware of the hardship that inflation puts on people, but now he needs to reduce demand to bring it more in line with supply. When he says reduce demand, what he means is make it so you can't afford to buy stuff. He's talking about making your life harder after he got richer personally. And the reason why he's doing that is because of these wage gains. Now, let's talk a little bit about what the effect of Jerome Powell's interest rate hikes is having, because we just got on Thursday, non-farm labor productivity came out. Now, labor productivity measures the dollar value of what you produce in an hour of work, right? Whether it's a good or a service, whatever it's worth that you made in that hour you worked. Now that rose 3.7% last month. So productivity is on the rise. American workers are actually getting slightly more productive. Good. But asterisk, work hours decreased oh. by 1.3%. So they're cutting back hours. Yeah. Put a pin in that, we'll be back to that. Now. The labor force productivity went up 3.7%. There's the number here, 3.7% increase in productivity. But the cost of labor went up 5.5%. And Jeez, this is in man. United States non-farm unit labor cost. All right, that's, that's a long-winded way of saying you're, how much you're making. 
there was a 5.5% increase in hourly compensation along with that 3.7% increase in productivity. All right, so that's right there. You're getting more productive, but your wages are rising faster than your productivity. That's the first time that's happened in a while, and that's why we're getting this positive real wage gains. The workers are finally in a position to benefit after two years of suffering. All right, now our productivity is rising, but our wages are rising faster. So for one month and one month only, things are getting a little better for us, guys. Congratulations. They, they're going to stop it. They're doing everything they can to stop it now. And, you know, just to case in point, they're already starting to cut back the hours worked. Now, they, the central bankers, are not cutting back your hours. Your employer's cutting back your hours. And the reason why they're doing that is because they can't afford the higher wages that they're paying to you because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. So your company pays rent on a building. The rent is going up because the interest on the mortgage on that building is going up. Your company has to borrow money to invest in new equipment, in new vehicles, in anything, right? So the, the cost of their debt is going up. And so interest expense is squeezing the profit margins of employers. At the same time, your wages are going up. That's also squeezing profit margins of employers. Now, when the profit margins get squeezed, the first thing they do is they cut back your hours. That's a desperate move. And it happens because they don't want to lose people. But eventually, that always gives way to layoffs. And that's what's coming now. As we're seeing hours work start to decrease, employers are already starting to cut back the hours because they can't afford these positive wage gains thanks to the rate hikes of the Federal Reserve. If the Fed didn't raise interest rates as aggressively, they'd be able to afford to pay you more, which you deserve because your standard of living has gone up and your labor is becoming more productive. Yeah. Now. Now we're starting to get headlines like this one. United Auto Workers demand a 40% pay hike in labor talks. And you got headlines like United Airlines reaches a preliminary four-year deal for 40% raises. Again, the last thing that happens in this inflation cycle is wages go up. First the money expansion, then the assets go up, then consumer prices, and then wages. We're in this final stage right now of the inflation cycle where wages would rise to compensate for the increase in the cost of living. You've also got it, the UPS union, right? They got a big raise to avoid their strike. American Airlines, a 21% raise to avoid a strike. People's wages are finally starting to go up, but because of the rate hikes, because of the economic hardship being inflicted on employers now, we're starting to see this chart. This is average weekly hours of all employees working in private payrolls, and you can see it's been declining steadily for a little over two years now. They're cutting back our hours because they can't afford it. And now we're actually just below the pre-pandemic average of hours worked, which means the layoffs are going to start very soon. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about here is this one. All right. Case in point, Yellow. All right. Now, Yellow is an outlier because it was a horribly run company, but Yellow Trucking just went out of business. 30,000 people on unemployment. So... If you have 30,000 people fewer in the job market, that means there is now less demand for labor. The Fed raising interest rates has reduced demand. And of course, what that actually looks like is people out of work, less demand for labor. This is what that looks like. 22,000 Teamsters and 8,000 regular employees on the breadline looking for work. So Jack, are the yellow unemployment numbers, which are full-time jobs, which is the horrible jobs to lose, is that included in the current unemployment numbers? No. Uh, the way it works, it takes a couple of weeks after you lose your job before you show up in initial jobless claims, and then a couple of more weeks you show up in continuing jobless claims, and then a few more weeks you'll actually show up in the unemployment rate. So the people who just lost their job at Yellow will not show up in unemployment, probably not for another month, at least maybe not even two months. My moderator, Mish, actually used to work in an wow. unemployment office, and he has this down to a science. He could do a better job explaining that particular case. Um, but these guys are not being counted yet. That's important to know. But they will be counted in future months. Okay. Now, this cycle of inflation bidding up asset prices and then consumer prices and lastly wages, I just want to mention what Jerome Powell with his boxing gloves trying to interrupt that last stage of the inflation cycle when wages rise. We've seen this play out over and over again over the last 50 years. This is not the first time they've done this.
They did this right before the global financial crisis. They did this right before the dot-com bubble. They did this in the 80s. They did this to stop the inflation of the 1970s. And what that looks like after 50 years is this chart. And guys, if you want, I, I tell you, this is one of the greatest websites in, the, in all of the internet. It's called WTF Happened in 1971. <laughs> and everything that has gone wrong, I'm, so many of these problems, so many of these issues that divide us, the racial disparities, the wealth gap, should we raise taxes or should you know more people go to work? All of these issues are sideshow distractions. This is the wealth gap in the United States. Hmm. WTF happened in 1971. Since 19, well, let's go all the way back to 1948, okay? Since 1948, the productivity of the American worker has risen 246%. That means the dollar value of the goods or services produced when you work for an hour has gone up two and a half times since 1948 but your hourly compensation has only gone up 115%, which means the benefits of the increase in your productivity, most of them are not going to you, the employee. Now, from 1948, mm -hmm. right up until about 1971, 1972, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these two lines were moving in lockstep, right? Everybody yeah. prospered. We had ingenuity and we had innovation and the average worker became more productive and so his boss got wealthier, but that employee started making more money also, and the two lines rose in unison. Everybody was sharing yeah. in the prosperity. Right. What right. WTF happened in 1971? In 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard, and that's when inflation became a matter of policy. That is when the ruling class decided to slowly start boiling the water and we are the frog. I've used this analogy a lot lately. We are the frog in the boiling pot. And Jerome Powell loves to talk about his 2% target of inflation because we've had this 2% inflation target for the last 50 years. And 2% is just enough inflation where you don't notice you're being boiled alive and so you don't demand a higher raise. And over 50 years of that, your productivity has risen, but you have not been compensated for it. And that's why after 50 years, now mom and dad have to work to achieve the same standard of living that we got 50 years ago with only one of them working. What because strong labor market, Jack? I, so far, what you've showed me is basically that the numbers are tainted. It's not a true depiction. It looks like it's a politically motivated anyways, but what strong labor market? There is no is strong labor market. You're right. There is no strong labor market. And what is happening right now where they increase your cost of living, making themselves rich, and then right before you get the raise to compensate, they turn the screws to the economy and cause a recession to put people out of work to make sure those raises never happen. And they mm. do it over and over again, and that's why this gap keeps getting bigger, why we don't get a raise even though we're generating more revenue and more profit for the ruling class, for the, for the ownership class. Right? And that's why the people who live on this yellow line tell you it would be suicide it would be crazy to go on the gold standard again well that's the people who are on this line saying it would be crazy of course it would be crazy for them to go back on the gold standard because they're not the ones living on the red line we are and so that is why this is happening right now because we finally got this this one little positive number where we start to recover from what we've lost in inflation and then on goes the boxing gloves up go the rate hikes and then begins the hours start to get cut back and then eventually the job losses and then stories like this stop dead in their tracks the 40 percent raises for the unions the the 20 percent raises the 10 percent raises at ups so there is no strong labor market and they're actually proactively trying to weaken the labor market to make sure it stays in their favor to make sure that the wealth gap grows even further let me sum up what you just said, Jack, and, I, and I'm going to give you a final word. But, you know, what I have seen and what you've really helped me understand is, is actually the job numbers aren't, you know, the job market isn't all it's cracked up to be. One thing that kind of hit me like across the face is how we're actually losing more full time jobs than gaining full time jobs. That's a huge wake up call. Yeah. And really, the job growth is all almost all when we do the numbers from part-time jobs. And another thing that is really crazy, Jack, is how for job openings, which is a gauge to for a tight labor market, 
because of the work from home, how you could basically have, count the same job 50 times, hypothetically 50 times because of the work from home phenomenon. I mean, let me ask you this, Jack, you know, all, when all is said and done, all of your meditating, all of your research, when do you think that it's going to, you know, the unemployment is going to hit both full-time and part-time hard enough to where we start seeing the actual unemployment rate, which we know is tainted. We know that that's tainted. Yep. But when do you think we're going to start seeing that kind of unhinge and, and start kind of skyrocketing up for a period? I, I, it probably won't happen as fast as as it looks like in some of the data that I just showed you, because remember that delay, like the yellow guys, they won't show right. up in the unemployment rate for a few months, possibly. Right. The Cause it lags so much. The lag. Yes. And let's also think yellow, right? Yellow moves stuff. They're, they're a shipping company. So if mm -hmm. the company that moves the stuff is going out of business, that means the company that makes the stuff and the company that sells the stuff, they're probably not too far behind. And wow. the hours being cut back shows that you cut the hours at the factory because you don't have to produce as much anymore. So I think we're probably still a few months away from that spike in unemployment and the jobs number, but we already see it happening in all of these other yeah. data points. And, and I really appreciate you being here, Jack, because a lot of this is pretty confusing. I think that you did a pretty good job at at least kind of explaining the cracks in the labor market. I mean, is it you know out of control unemployment right now? No, it's not yeah. out of control, but look at the trends. Are we still below in certain areas pre-pandemic? Yeah, in certain areas, maybe. But the thing is, is like every trend we're looking at here is not only trending in the opposite direction of things that are going good. You've also pointed out several, several inconsistencies of data, even manipulating and tainting the data. So the reality is, I mean, man, can we really blame people for like not understanding what's going on? I mean, can you blame people for wanting to trust who they voted for? Yeah, I mean, well, that's why I say this, the stink of politics when it gets into the data. You know, these things are so important. They need to be above politics. And politics has become a team sport where you just root for your team just because, right? You root for the Yanks because you're from New York. You root for a certain side because that's what you were raised into. And you, at least it's not the other guy. And so you overlook what your guy does. And both sides do that. And you end up with this mess that we're in. And while we're arguing over these petty issues, the real powers that be in the world, the central bankers who control everything on both sides of the aisle are turning the screws to us like they have done for 50 years since 1971. And that wealth gap just keeps growing. And you know, you got to keep the people turned on each other, keep us fighting amongst ourselves so that we don't notice what is really being done to us. I'm afraid you may be right, Jack. Can you kind of, you know, end on what advice, maybe what words can you give you know, people that are wait, let's just say waiting for price drops, or maybe even they're priced out of home ownership. What can you tell them about the data that we just went over? So the data that we just saw shows that the job market is nowhere near as strong as they're telling us. All right. And the job market is the key to the housing market. So all of this underlying weakness in the labor market means that demand for these homes, the people who would buy them with their paychecks, is about to fall, all right? And at the same time, if we're only a few months away from layoffs, layoffs means new supply of homes because when somebody loses their job, they become a home seller, not because they wanna be, but because they have to be, their house gets foreclosed on. Now that takes several months also. So the foreclosures don't start until a few months after the layoffs. So it's not gonna be next week. The crash is not gonna be next week. It might be starting. We're seeing a lot of the charts roll over like you just showed us in, in the video we did on my channel. But the actual slam down, probably still a few months off, but it is coming. It absolutely is coming. And the central bankers see these labor disputes that are happening all over the economy and 40% raises being gotten by these airline pilots and the UPS guys, right? And they're looking at that and they're saying, oh no, if people start making more money, then they're yeah. going to start spending it and they're going to reignite inflation. And so they're going to say, we need to inflict even more harm on people when in my opinion, They've already raised interest rates way too much. They're looking at these big union contract settlements and they're saying we haven't done enough and they're gonna make a huge mistake by raising rates further. <clears throat> intriguing, intriguing. So just to reiterate what you said, you're saying that rates are high enough, potentially yes. are high enough. And, and really what's happening here is just not enough time has gone by yet because obviously it takes time to flush through the system and things like that. So you're actually thinking, Jack, that 
they went too tight, too high, too fast. Yep. And, and we just Bernanke. as consumers, and we yeah. don't know that yet as consumers, because my God, the, I mean, what do we want to talk about? We want to talk about the data revisions. We want to talk about the, the, the political biasness. I mean, geez, dude, what a take, Jack. I did not <clears throat> expect you to come on here and say, Travis, things are real bad. If the Fed stops raising rates, we're still going to be okay as far as the reset, as far as the crash. Really astonishing, Jack. Mm -hmm. Really astonishing. So in other words, calm down, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, right? It, it's coming. I do think it's the, the, the delays in this, right? You know, remember the, that memorable scene from the big short that you can't show on the screen because you'll get censored from YouTube. Um, the girl with the teaser rates expiring on her loans. Ben Bernanke was raising rates the whole time, 2005, 2006, 2007. He's raising rates, but it didn't hit the market until 2007, 2008, because everybody had locked in those introductory <laughs> teasers. So Dude. their payments didn't go up as Bernanke raised rates, but when the teaser expired, all of those rate hikes hit all at once, and now they're insolvent. Um, That's dude, what's just, happening right now, the lagging effect of those rate hikes. And that just hit me like a, like a ton of bricks, dude. They were doing, they were raising their rates in 2006. All of the warning signs were there, Jack. So like hindsight is 2020. Like we look back and like, man, you know, and I got wrapped up in it. So I, I mean, I get it, but my goodness, dude, I mean, the same thing is happening, you know, 06, they're not paying attention and you see it in the numbers. GDP was like, I think it was above 3% even in 2006 and in 2007, GDP was above 2% and then everything changed. So there's just, you know, when all said and done, you know, listening to you, Jack, hearing this report, what it's demonstrating to me is how important it is for me individually to ask myself, what do I want? Right. I, I can't lean on anyone or anything entirely. We can't. So, I, you know, I, I think it's just another reason why people like myself, even you, everyone really got to meditate. What do I want? And also when it comes to home ownership, being that it is such an emotional purchase, I mean, what are people getting right now? On average, they're, if they buy a home right now, they'll probably have to put $50,000 down of their own hard-earned savings. They're going to go up as far as shelter expenses. On average, $1,000 a month. I mean, you, you, it's potential that you're going to join the 93% of buyers that have regret. The emotion is so toxic right now, Jack. I mean, the emotion alone with these asset prices running up, I think that alone, once that kind of catches up, alone is going to have impacts on prices decline. But when we add the quantitative tightening and we see the lag effects and we see how it's coming slowly, I mean, man, there's a giant storm just right there, just right in front of us. Why aren't more people understanding this? You know, I think most people would say something along the lines of they won't let that happen again. And I always say they with a capital T. Oh, they won't let that happen. They would never do that. All right. And well, what people need to realize is they are doing that on purpose. They're using soft language. Jerome Powell is saying, we wanna bring demand more in line with supply. What he's really saying is, I wanna inflict enough economic hardship on the average person that they can't afford to buy stuff, all right? And when the most powerful people in the world, the central bankers, want to inflict hardship on people, they are almost always successful. So yeah. it's coming <laughs> and it's happening on purpose and don't for a second think that they are on your side you know, I talked to Lynette Zhang on my channel a few days ago, and she said their biggest priority is to keep their job. It's not to protect you, it's to protect their power. And that's that Youth. gap between the productivity and the compensation, that they're preserving that gap. They wanna keep growing that gap because that's them getting more powerful. Now, Jack, do you think Jerome Powell so far has done a good job since quantitative tightening since last year? No, no, I think Jerome Powell's done a terrible job. And you know, did Jerome Powell have terrible intentions? That's debatable. And honestly, I, I couldn't really care less about intentions because yeah. the net effect, Results. he has introduced so much grotesque money printing. And, you know, he could have not printed the money and it would have inflicted a lot of hardship on people. He could have not lowered interest rates to zero and that would have inflicted a lot of hardship on people. But instead, he did and he made the bubble bigger. And when you make the bubble bigger, you make the bursting more painful. So he, he committed the, the cardinal sin of short-term comfort at the expense of long-term pain. 
Mm. And it's, we see this rot mm. all in every aspect of our economy, this instant gratification yeah. problem. And you know, that's why those, you, you folks on the sidelines, don't FOMO, don't give into that need for instant gratification, or you will just be exit liquidity for the ruling class who are selling at the top. Don't be that guy. Don't be me in 2006, buying or my me. first condo and losing all my yeah. money on it. Yeah, my hardship, Jack, it made some investor rich because they were Absolutely. able to buy my house for pennies on the dollar. I know that because of the uh, deficiency notice I got from the IRS that I had to pay taxes on, which followed me around for, I think, nine years, nine or 10 years. It was horrible. But Jack, hey, man, wonderful presentation. We're at about 50 minutes, brother. Uh, really appreciate you on here. Hopefully, you know, I'll have you come on periodically, man. I want some, you know, someone that knows more about the economy, job, GDP, come on and talk to us. So I really appreciate that. You guys, don't forget to go over his channel, Nobody Special Finance. Give him some love. Jack, anything you want to say before we go? Hey, I just want to say to anybody who's watching at 53 minutes and 45 seconds, you are awesome. Thank you for sticking <laughs> around. You guys rock. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, they'll stick, they'll stick around, man, if the value is there. I appreciate you, yeah. brother. Uh, Till next time, all right? Have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Jack. Now, if you guys are out there investing in real estate, I do wish you luck and I hope you win.